afternoon. Welcome to this special mock tech session. I have a very special guest today uh, who will talk to the exchange for media readers, the pitch readers, the impact readers, or shall I say viewers. The line between a reader and viewer has merged. We have become video first, digital first. Exchangeformedia.com was started 20 years back. So we started it in the digital arena, but moved to print. We have a very, very special guest. Uh, possibly he was into mock tech before it was called mock tech or ad tech. Uh, he's been an author, he's been an investor. Uh, he was one of the blue eyed boys in the first dot com era. He sold his business to another entity, made lots of money, and since then has done many ads. He's advised political leaders, he's worked with them, he's written a book. He continues to use his passion for technology to help businesses. Let me welcome Rajesh Jain, the founder and CEO of Netcore, to this exchange for media, Mark Tech Talk. Uh, thank you, Rajesh, for joining us. Uh, My pleasure, Anurag. Thank you very much for inviting me. You know, Rajesh, you have reinvented yourself a couple of times in the last 30 years. So is there a playbook to reinvention? I think the only playbook is that you've got to build profitable businesses. <laughs> Otherwise, you fail. We are for, sometimes in reinvention gets necessitated. Um, but actually, the, when I started India World, it was because I failed with my first couple of ventures after I returned from the US. Then India World got sold, so I had to got acquired by SIFI. Uh, I had to look for something new, and that's how we started Netcore. And Netcore itself has morphed three or four times because that's the only way you survive and thrive. And when you say uh, Netcore has morphed three, four times, can you? take the viewers through that because every time you would have chosen something that the market needs. Absolutely. So take us through that journey. Sure. So when Netcore, when we started, it was basically uh, a mail infrastructure company. So we did mail servers, Linux based mail servers for companies. That was, uh, that was about 20 years ago. And then uh, we didn't grow much for the first seven or eight years. We were very small. I kept creating new things, but I could not sell it. And that's when I decided that I have to get, um, a CEO and a CEO to help build the business out. And under their leadership, uh, we've taken, uh, we've sort of grown leaps and bounds. Um, we've had now three CEOs. Uh, Kalpit Jain is our uh, third CEO. And the first we started then with uh, essentially enterprise SMS services. This was somewhere around 2007. Then we added email marketing uh, around 2008-9. Then we had uh, email API based services. Uh, like what SendGrid has been offering for the last many years. And then 2014-15, we added uh, marketing automation, MarTech uh, to the fold. Uh, and uh, as we've been growing in India over the last four or five years, it's also expanded outside of India. So in Southeast Asia, Middle East, Africa, and the US. So the growth has been both in the product side and in the geography side. Fantastic. Uh, today, uh, businesses are struggling. Big businesses, mid-sized businesses, small businesses. Some of them have been taken down by COVID for no fault of theirs. Their sectors have disappeared because they were high contact businesses like hospitality, like airlines, like restaurants. Other businesses are not doing well because the sentiment is weak and everyone is conserving cash. Businesses are looking at performance. If they're deploying one rupee, they possibly want at least one rupee to come out, if not two, five, ten. So tell us uh, why is velvet rope marketing we are so important? And can for our, can you for our viewers define what is velvet rope marketing? Absolutely. So Anurag, essentially the idea comes from the fact that in every business there are certain set of customers who are disproportionately more valuable than the others. So to paraphrase a quote from Animal Farm, it says, all customers are equal, but some customers are more equal than others. So what you really need to do is to take care of these customers very well. But before you can take care, you need to identify these customers. Who in your entire customer base really is the largest contributors to your revenues? And they'll probably be even higher contributors to your profitability. So first is the identification of your quote, best customers. Then how do you create an experience which ensures they don't churn away? Because when a best customer goes, it's a big loss for any business, B2C or B2B. 
So how do you create what we call the velvet rope experience? Well, use velvet rope marketing to essentially make sure that they stay on. Then comes the long tail of customers. There are some among them who have great potential to be best customers. So how do you identify them early? What are the signals that you can read uh, from the data that customers today leave for us, uh, for brands? How can you identify who will be the future best customers? And then apply the same ideas by taking data from the attributes of the best customers and then ensuring that the acquisition of new customers is also optimized. How do you acquire more profitable customers by looking at the lookalikes of the best customers? So in doing all of this, I think what businesses can really do is to do two things, which both impact profitability in a big way. First is grow revenue from their best customers. They are the best bets. So you want to be able to grow revenue from them. And second is they can actually cut down uh, advertising costs, marketing costs, in the, on the acquisition side. So you're not acquiring the whole universe. You're filtering the types of customers that you want to acquire and then onboard them uh, faster. By doing both of these things, uh, by uh, ensuring that uh, the good customers don't go and good and future good customers are acquired, future best customers are acquired, I think they can make a huge impact on profitability for the business. Fantastic uh, for laying out that. You know, earlier we in the media, we in the in the entrepreneurial space sometimes got carried by how much money does one raise? That was the headline. Oh, it's a unicorn because it's raised money at a billion dollar valuation, but it was losing hundred million dollars. Tell us how big startups, big e-commerce companies have suddenly moved to a path to profitability. Instead of being unicorns, they want to be proficons. They want to be profitable unicorns. So tell us how has that mind shift happened? And how do you see things going forward? See, I think uh, for every business, like you said in the beginning, there is a uh, there was the pre-COVID world which was there, and now there's the post-COVID world. This is the reality. Uh, it's not going to go away anytime soon. Consumer behavior is going to be changed uh, quite significantly. You've covered a lot of that in your uh, previous sessions, interactions. Now, I think what really uh, CEOs and uh, CMOs need to look at is that in a world where profits are under pressure, where sort of capital, there are constraints on raising capital. Uh, what, how is it that you can actually create a new path to profitability? And that's where I sort of coined this word proficon. Uh, there's a different mindset that a proficon has with a unicorn. And I'll give you uh, sort of the definition, what I came up with and the characteristics of what I see as a proficon. Um, the definition in my mind is a company which is profitable, which is private. So they're sort of uh, uh, not public. Uh, they are promoter funded. So they are bootstrapped. So they have actually built the business with the profits of the business reinvested and they have a reasonable valuation. Okay, so, um, and it's actually possible to build businesses like these. I've done it twice in my life um, and successfully. Now, there is a mindset difference because the way you approach it, if, if capital were easy to get, like you said, you know, you're just acquiring new customers all the time. You're burning cash on every, on unit, uh, trans on every transaction. Yeah, um, cost per acquisition mattered, but it didn't matter because you had, you had unlimited supply of money. Absolutely. So I think in this scenario, what businesses need to do, I think there are sort of three key differences, which I look at in the mindset between a proficon and a, and a unicorn. I think the first is that in times like these, and we have seen it happen now, a lot of unicorns tend to fire people. Proficons tend to hire because you got to go against uh, the conventional wisdom. I think this is a great time to build businesses and we'll see this probably a few years down the line. That if you could, in, if you had the capital to invest right now, to actually make the right decisions on growing your team, uh, uh, you'll come out very strong in maybe two, three years time. The second is the thinking about the long term rather than the short term. So, you know, uh, Simon Sinek's new book, The Infinite Game, talks about this. That business has no finish line. Yeah, that business is it's an infinite game that is there, the infinite mindset. So today, because I don't have to worry about investors, there's no one sitting on my head and saying, you've got to cut your staff costs by 20%. And that's the easiest way to cut cost, staff and marketing costs. Um, uh, there's no one doing that. Instead, we have cash in the bank. 
we are willing to make the investments we are saying okay what is the type of company we want to be in 2 to 3 years time now let's work towards building that company by making the right investments today and the third is uh, what i call anti fragile versus fragile so a lot of unicorns we see or even a lot of startups who are not profitable are very fragile because once the capital gets turned off then it's a very difficult uh, option uh, that they face there's a difficult set of options that they face instead uh, netcore through our 20 years plus years in existence we faced a number of shocks okay sometime regulatory changes uh, uh, so, uh, and most of the times regulatory sometime changes technology advancements technology advancements etc we are to borrow the phrase from nasim taleb's book anti fragile so the things basically every shock has made us stronger and that's what proficons basically benefit from because the top team has a longer term view is willing to hire is willing to make the right investments in growth i think uh, that's the foundation on which you build profitable businesses thank you rajesh at this point i want to talk to you about the cost of customer acquisition how do you think that marketing technology can bring down the cost of customer acquisition we know that but can you give us an example and a case study where the impact was so huge that you know it wasn't imagined before yeah so <laughs> essentially if you think about what type of customers to acquire okay i think that is the key now how do you decide what type of customers to acquire because all customers are not equal and this is where the idea of velvet rope marketing that i talked about earlier comes in now one of the core pillars of velvet rope marketing is the ability to identify customer lifetime value so essentially you are going to spend a certain cost for acquisition cac customer acquisition cost but what is the customer worth if the cac is going to be more than the lifetime value of the customer then you are going to lose on that uh, acquisition so figuring out clv becomes very important and what we have actually done is used very cutting edge uh, marketing models to get a forward looking predictive value on what the clv for every customer is going to be now the advantage of the clv is it does two things for you it lets you segment all your customers so you can find okay these are my best customers these are the rest of the customers second is it lets you take attributes of the best customers and say but how can i generate more such customers so the first pool available is the rest customer so you have volume how do you create value from the volume that you already have so these are your customers whom you have acquired they are not doing too many transactions what are the methods by which you can actually get them to do uh, additional transactions and that's where another interesting idea comes in that of what we call uh, the best customer genome or the customer genome so i can look at all the attributes of different customers and then say okay these are the attributes that are uh, shared among the best customers so how do i take my other customers and get them towards towards becoming like the best customers then when you look at acquisition now what you're doing is again the same idea the high clv customers what are the attributes of those customers and now when i'm looking at acquisition how do i use that data from the martech world for ad tech how do i use the data which is sitting in my crm or cdp system and use it for acquisition because traditionally these two worlds have been largely independent they work in silos but if we can cross pollinate data between them i think companies can a reduce their cost of acquisition which i think is going to become very very important because like we talked earlier budgets are going to shrink going forward and second is they will acquire better customers they will acquire customers who are going to be more profitable for them so you have a double benefit by using this ad tech martech bridge as it were you know what you are saying is there used to be a pareto's law i don't know if you know remember yes. it says that 20% of your customers give you 80% of your revenues or value absolutely in some way uh, you know you're also alluding to that in the way you're talking about that there are some customers who are more valuable and how to identify and keep them and how to identify such from the the secondary set of customers that you may have absolutely uh, raki rajesh one point to yeah. that and see the the um, uh, Uh, and for most businesses and now you talked about case studies we've done analytics for a large number of companies and in most companies we find that 20% customers will have let's say 50 60 70% of revenue 
Okay, now, so these customers, now you can use a, a MarTech platform to really create the right journeys for them, the right campaigns for them. That becomes very critical. So it could be, well, I'll give you a simple example. Um, we all love to watch movies, you know, multiplexes, Inox, PVR, it'll be some time probably before we go back again there. But many of the multiplexes today still, we find the experience is that, um, it's like, you know, that movie 50 first dates, you are a new customer for them every time. And so the result is that when a good new movie is releasing on a Thursday morning, okay, you are, you are in the queue with everyone else, the digital queue, trying to book tickets. And if you forget, then you'll end up with probably seats which you don't get together or you won't get to the right show. Imagine a different world where the brand experience is very different, where the multiplex basically sends you a mail on Thursday morning, which says, Anurag, you are part of our Velvet Rope marketing program. We know that you like to watch your movies on Saturday evening at 5.30. These are the seats that you like. We have reserved X number of seats for you. We will hold these seats for the next two hours. This is only exclusively available for you. One click to pay and the seats are yours. What a different world we are living in. Now, but to make this, they have to collect all the data. They have to act on it. They have to automate their systems. This is the real opportunity for brands today. And when we, so it's, it's not just about creating an online presence. How do you collect data at every touch point? How do you now calculate the lifetime value? So I can treat Anurag differently from Rajesh because Anurag has a probably a five times higher CLV than what Rajesh has. That is the opportunity which brands have today, which is absolutely doable. And that's the key for driving greater profitability. You know, I, I want to come to at this point. How do you develop the skill set in your colleagues to be able to understand data analytics? How do you reskill them? How do you make them relevant for this new well well rope marketing scenario? Because I, the tools may be new. If our ways, how we think, how we look at it, are appreciation for technology are so how do you build that culture very good question i think what companies now need to think of is this new emerging world of data engineering data analytics data science and ai so a lot of this does not have to be done uh, by people there is some role of course for uh, then the data cleanup so let's say you're collecting customer data first step is how do i collect data at every touch point okay so even if you are a D2C brand, let us say, you are just selling uh, through maybe Amazon or Flipkart. In those cases, you will not get data about your uh, end customers. But can you put something in the packaging? Maybe there is a QR code. Maybe there is a link which someone can get additional uh, warranty uh, on where the customers have an incentive to tell you who they are. That's the first step. That does not require too much of uh, re-engineering. It's just a mindset change. That if I can get data about my customers for the next purchase and for uh, uh, additional upgrade, cross sell, uh, upsell, cross sell, I can actually reach out to them directly. Number one, the skill sets which are which become required here are you need to do some amount of data enrichment. You need to ensure that the data is processed, data is clean. So that sort of one world of data engineering, if you can club it broadly there. Then you need a team which can now, as you collect all this data, it's very hard for you to sift through all of this data, figure out the patterns that is there. This is where you now move to the AI world. That there's a lot of machine learning techniques which can you can apply. If you have a lot of data, you have a training set that you can give, uh, the, the, uh, you train the data and then it will start making uh, predictions for you uh, uh, on the forward looking side. That then gives you ideas on what to expect going forward. That is where you start sort of predicting the future uh, as it were. So these are two skill sets. And the third one I think is just creativity. It's what is it that you can do with your best customers? We are all customers of different brands. If we just take for a moment and think where we think we are best customers of, okay, what are the experiences that we would like, which would delight us? That is where it needs creativity. It needs people, uh, say, in the in a customer success team of a brand, uh, who can use marketing technology platforms, who can use ad tech, uh, who can work with agencies uh, and companies to do this. But it's a new skill set which has to be added 
to the layer of creating the products selling them and so on that was the earlier world today every brand has to go direct direct has to go digital has to think of a direct to consumer strategy and has to collect data and once you start collecting data then this whole pipeline of data engineering velvet rope marketing etc starts thank you rajesh as an entrepreneur as a media platform owner when you're talking i'm thinking of how it applies to my own business so i'll possibly talk to you about it some other day but Absolutely. i want to come to another angle today when we talk of marketing uh, we're dealing with three more v's well now you added the velvet in it but there is voice there is video and there is vernacular which is indian language one tell us how can marketing uh takes these three realities of indian language content because content marketing is that thing of voice and of video to a large extent uh, <coughs> excuse me to a large extent most <coughs> sorry to a large extent most martech platforms are sort of agnostic see what they are building is basically okay so you think of it as like this there's a content factory and then there is a pipe to the customer the content factory is the one which has to worry about what is the language so they need to know what is the preferred language that a customer sort of interacts in um i'll give you my own example um jio for some reason has figured out that i like hindi uh, much more than i like english so most of the messages <laughs> i have no idea how um uh, most of the messages that i actually get in hindi okay rather than english and if they are just analyze their data saying that rajesh has never ever clicked uh, on a hindi sms okay then they would probably stop sending the messages but they are probably not doing that this is where brands need to start looking start listening to the customer and that's the job of the content factory team so i can create uh, some customers more comfortable on voice some uh, video will become a very important method of actually doing uh, selling uh not many of us will be comfortable going into stores probably for some more time so let's say you wanted to buy furniture okay you'll probably be very comfortable if you do it a video call on zoom uh, uh and see uh, uh what is the furniture that is there it becomes an interactive call with the store owner because you are hesitant to walk into a store now these are uh, circumstances which the brand owners are not prepared for today so i think voice to video sort of the gap that is there is now getting eliminated what you earlier did on voice okay pre covid okay a lot of our calls in our own company were voice conference calls very few of us actually did video calls if we could not do in person there were voice bridges okay today it's a zoom link for everyone we don't even think twice even one to one calls are becoming zoom conversations because we like to see each other as an alternative to that so the vernacular voice and video really become part of the content factory that is there and then what brands are setting up through the martech platforms uh, the multiple uh, delivery channels the journeys etc is the pipe to reach to the customer and in there what you want to be able to do is to do personalization you want to ensure that the right message goes to the right person at the right time to the right channel that is where what brands also need to do is to figure out what is the channel my customer each customer likes to interact on and therefore if you are an email person if i am an sms person i will not get an email and you will not get an sms or now whatsapp is emerging as a channel there are multiple options which are opening up for brands fantastic rajesh at this point i want to come to one key question is that if you had to predict trends for the next 12 18 months uh, you know which means that whatever we are doing right now becomes our habit post i hoping post 3 months corona will be under control so tell us three trends that you forecast for the next 18 to 36 months okay. in technology forecasting beyond that can yeah, we have it rest so i'm not asking you one yeah i think um, uh if i sort of narrow the question a little bit so it's uh, in the in the context of say uh, for marketers and for ceos as business owners really or as marketers uh, driving the businesses what is it that they'd like i think the number one is going to be a a very sharp focus on profitability 
I think the first thing to realize is that you said the next 12, 18 months, I think the Corona virus backdrop is going to stay with us probably for the next couple of years. Okay. Till we have a virus, which gives uh, lasting immunity. What do you mean? Pardon? You mean a vaccine? A vaccine. A vaccine. Yes. A vaccine right. that... Yeah. We get a vaccine, which gives us immunity for a longer period of time. Uh, I think that is, uh, um, so uh, for businesses, it's very important that uh, the focus on profitability becomes very, very critical, um, which may not have been there earlier because there was always a way by which capital could be raised. Okay, in an uncertain world, investors are also less likely to invest. So number one, I think is, is profitability, a focus on profitability. Number two, I think is health becomes very, very paramount. So whether it is health of our own, our own health, uh, employees' health, customers' health, all of this. I mean, if you are seeing those, uh, uh, all the trends are pointing towards a, a big shift really in the customer's perception because that is paramount. Things which you always took for granted. Okay, uh, we now hesitate. Should I, uh, the risk level has gone up. Should I, I may want to go to that restaurant, but should I go or not? Should I take that flight or not? Okay. Uh, when I'm going shopping, what is the distance that I now need to keep between the person in front of me and behind? If that person is not wearing a mask, then what do I do? So all of these things which we never thought about are all coming to the fore in our own customer experiences, which also means that the third trend sort of derives from the second one is that because there is going to be some amount of hesitations in the real world experiences that we are all going to have, the requirement to have a digital presence, even for brands who have traditionally not been digital, become very, very important. So I'll give you a simple example. There is a store, uh, there's a shop outside my uh, building, which basically is a textile shop, small shop, but fantastic collection of, uh, of saris and, and uh, women's garments. Now, the way the shop is, well, not more than three uh, people could be in the shop at the same time. Now the challenge for them becomes a first is of course reopening. Second is that small pace. I cannot probably accommodate more than one customer. Now opportunity for them also now becomes that can I create a presence digitally, whether it's on Amazon, Flipkart and the marketplaces or even my store.com and therefore reach out to customers whom I otherwise would never have been able to tap into because I was limited by the geographical footprint of the store. So profits, health and digital, I think, or going digital sort of direct to customer become that I think are going to be the three big trends. And I, and I think they are all going to be sort of irreversible for the near future. Thank you, Rajesh. I have enjoyed this conversation. Just before I close this, uh, I'll take one of the audience questions. Uh, Kushbu Priya is asking, do you think brands are ready to hire marketing professionals in the next six to 12 months across sectors, given brands are facing issues of profitability and revenue in COVID times? I think they will hire the people with the right skill sets. We spoke about that earlier. See, a lot of customers. And what are those skill sets? Just to reiterate that for the viewers, what are those skill sets? I think the three skill sets were data engineering and understanding of machine learning, AI and ML. And third is creativity. Thinking, putting yourself in the in the foot, uh, in the shoes of the customer, of the new customer, of the digitally savvy customer, and then what is the experience that they would like to have? So I think the type of uh, professionals that companies need to hire are ones who can a make them go digital. Okay, how do I create a uh, brand presence online? If I have a brand presence, how do I strengthen it? How can you help me collect data at every touch point that I'm having with the customer? And third is that based on all of this data that's coming in, how do I do that pipeline of data engineering, of analytics, of figuring out how to use ideas like Velvet Rope marketing uh, to improve uh, the entire experience on getting the best customers, identifying the best customers, and then uh, acquiring better ones uh, like them. So it's, it's really a new world of data that's coming, uh, coming about. I think marketing professionals who can understand this new emerging world of data analytics, data science, I think will definitely have a, a big demand and advantage going forward because that's what uh, brands are going to have to do. 
thank you rajesh i look forward to reading your book and uh, i hope i interact more and acquire those skills that you talk about uh, thank you for talking to exchange for media at the mark tech bridge i hope technology can be the bridge that gets you to get the customers and the profitability that you need in covid time thank you rajesh jain for being a pioneer in this space and continuing to reinvent thank you thank you very much anurag great uh, talking with you thank you